from which I've, I've looked at the literature from the Wilderness Canoe Association, and it reads really well. It's a far cry from what you'd see at a children's summer camp or a um, uh, or a school board. Yeah. It's a good one, in other words. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we'll start because you're almost getting into it. <laughs> I know I'm going to, I'm, I'm trying Credits to for that one, go to Gary for sure. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mute everybody and then I'll unmute Bob. Um, Tom, I made you a co-host so you can help me with the participants and the chat. I'll look out for stragglers. Yeah. Stragglers. <laughs> um, I'm looking at it too. Oh, there's Tom. Okay. I'll let that Tom in. Um, so I'll introduce Bob. Uh, so Bob, I'll read off the website here. Bob has been guiding canoe trips since the summer of 1973. And as you know, the WCA started in 1973. Um, early travels in Algonquin, Tamagami, Quantico, oh, wow. eventually led to Arctic. Um, Bob taught outdoor education at McMaster University from 1980 to 2009. He writes mainly about outdoor heritage travel and conceptualizing uh, outdoor education. Recently, he co-edited uh, Paddle Pathways, Reflections oh. from a Changing Landscape, winner of the Best uh, Anthropological 2023 and New Generational Indie Book Award, and finalist for Best Nonfiction with Whistler Book Awards. So welcome, Bob. Well, thank you. Thanks for the introduction. And uh, um, so Tom, who's also a co-host, just to let you know, I'm I'm going to make sure there's time for questions at the end. And uh, there's a couple of places where you can unmute people for sure, because I've written in my own notes, does somebody have something they'd like to add to this? So I've built that into my, my thinking. Uh, but to get started with where we were just rambling together, one of the things that's important for me to say at the outset is I sort of believe that the main thing, uh, it's the main thing is that the main thing should be the main thing. <laughs> and uh, for me, the main thing when we guide a group is that we put nature first because it's a powerful force uh, and we put joy at the center and safety is obvious. And so if safety isn't negated, safety is paramount. But if we only think about safety, we get stuck. And I think that that's happening. It may not be happening because we want it to happen, but it certainly is happening in school boards because of uh, risk management plans, where the assumption is that we can, you know, uh, obliterate risk. You know, there is no such thing as 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 uh, getting rid of risk. So. That's just a little real preamble. I want to sort of warm us all up by telling a few stories. And then I'm hoping that there'll be a quick story somebody can add. And what these stories are meant to do is show a kind of tension that exists between the risk management plan that you may be forced or asked to follow uh, and your experience in the moment in the field. So the first one is, a, it'll be a scenario. If you know Quetico, you're at the uh, north end of Sturgeon Lake and you've got a food drop at Lac La Croix in three days and you've got a big storm uh, brewing and you can't paddle during the day and you know that you've lost a day. So you do the full length of the Sturgeon, which is about, I don't know, 15 kilometers and you've got a good night and you do it as a night trip. And you do that because then the next morning you wake up and you have two, relatively speaking, normal days to make your food drop. If you don't night trip because your risk management plan says you can't and the weather was good for it, then, then the experience in the field has been compromised because you've lost the responsibility to make choices because of your risk management plan. Because in that scenario, the wise choice would be to night trip. Because if you don't night trip, to make your food drop, you've got to put in, I don't know, three 60 kilometer days or 40 kilometer days, let's say. Too much work. And that makes it harder and more dangerous than the night tripping. Because to trip that hard and to trip from you know sunrise to sunset is more likely to incur uh, incidents than it would be to night trip. 
but the risk management policy says no night tripping. So I'm trying to give you a scenario whereby night tripping would be the safer option. A similar but different kind of example is the ax issue. And what's happened in a lot of programs is no axes are allowed on the trip. So the guide can't bring one. And, and, and that's, I suppose, because it, it could be perceived as a weapon or it's a dangerous tool. And it is. But if you have a three day rain and you've got cold people and you can't and you want to get a fire going. Well, speaking personally, I suppose I only know how to do that if I have an axe. And what I would do would be I would get into a big stump and work it with, with an axe because that's really hard to do with a saw or other to tools that you might have. And I would get that dry material. And I'm pretty comfortable with an ax getting a fire going in a three day rain. So now I can have a fire, get warm, comfortable people on the edge of a tarp and serve them perhaps a meal that otherwise they'd be eating peanut butter on a spoon, you know, or maybe cooking on a stove, but often that gets uh, passed over too. So my point is there's a situation whereby axes aren't being taken and, and you're creating a dangerous situation depending on the weather that you get without the ax. Similarly, it's, we're asking people to, um, in a way to suspend their skill development. In other words, the ability to, to work with wood um, is being lost because it's deemed that the ax is dangerous. Uh, I would rather teach people how to use the ax wisely. So it's just another situation. Uh, a, a third is a, just really simply a joy risk tension piece. And I know this isn't applying so much to the Wilderness Canoe Association trips, but uh, most of the school board trips that I'm aware of and programs like, oh, I'm drawing a blank, uh, Alive. Alive? Alive Outdoors, yeah. They, they, they have a no jumping off rocks policy. And I'm not talking about 30 foot cliffs here. I'm talking about a, 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 a four foot ledge and of course, once the water's checked to be deep, I, I see no problem with having a group of people jumping off rocks and having a, you know, a joyous little moment. Um, but it's considered not worth the risk because it's not a primary function of the canoe trip. But I think it is a primary function of canoe trip from the perspective of what brings joy. And you tell a kid too many times that they can't do this and they can't do that. And they start looking for things that are sort of counterproductive to the functioning of the trip. There's just too many no's going on. I know of a trip where uh, an individual got up and it was one of those super hot mornings. They were an NLS uh, instructor and they were told they couldn't go for a morning dip because their guide had to watch them and he was cooking breakfast. And that's sort of leaning to a point that I'll make about common sense. Another quick one is if no filtered water no drinking water. So you must filter all your water. Okay, so your water filter breaks and you're on Lake Opiongo, Lake Big Trout Lake, whatever. Uh, and all of a sudden you're, you're told by your risk management plan that you can't drink the water from the lake. And, and what happens, heat stroke? It might seem like a ridiculous story, but I know that it happened to a friend of mine where she um, pulled up on a group on Lake Tomogamy who weren't drinking enough water and were in trouble because of it. And they weren't drinking because their risk management plans said that they shouldn't and they didn't want to get in trouble. So I'm saving my favorite one to the end. It's happened to my friend, Al Brown. He'd love me to use his name, I'm sure. And he was on a ORCA course. And as, as uh, he tells the story, and it's almost hard to believe, but uh, he made me, I made him promise that it was true. He went, it was a lunch hour and everybody was taking a break and he went for a little swim in one of those cascading waterfalls where it was waterfall pool, waterfall pool. And um, I know exactly where he was. And uh, he went into one of the pools for a swim and uh, he was just sort of lounging around there. And a minute later or so, a throw bag is thrown at him for safety. And, and, and it didn't need to happen but they were trying to make a point that he shouldn't have gone for the swim. And, and I suppose that you could argue that he should have gone with somebody else, 
but he's an adult and it was a very safe situation. They deemed it not to be safe. And one might be going, well, what's the problem with throwing the throw bag? And I think one of the problems is, is we forget about the, I don't know, is it the word ancillary? We forget about the other possible considerations. Like what is the message in throwing a throw bag to a guy who's lounging in, in a pool on a hot day? Uh, the, the message I think is that nature is dangerous and nature is not comfortable. Nature is not home. Nature is other. Nature is alien. And I suppose that's a reasonable message, but it may be counter to the message that you're trying to uh, instill or offer. So that's a bunch of stories that I've gone through quickly. What, what are the, what's the punchline of the story? Um, the story, the punchline is that there's a loss of responsibility in the field. Uh, who owns, where is the ownership for the risk? Is it with the guide? It, is it with the operator? Is it with the legal team? Uh, these are questions that are rarely asked. And I, I think it ultimately we've, we've, uh, it should be with the guide, uh, but it isn't, I don't think. So I'm gonna pause now and, and wonder if there's one or two and, and be quick with these so that I can sort of get through my program and we can have a good chat at the end. But I wondered if somebody's got a story that's in keeping with that or wants to respond to one of those stories and you know either shoot it down or what have you. So it's a little open space for two or three minutes. I believe the risk management should be a group thing, not necessarily an individual. Hmm, interesting, yeah. So the, so the responsibility is with the group, uh, especially with an adult group. Absolutely, it should be, and you should actually at certain, top, and we've done this with Gary before, we sat at the top of a set of rapids, we've talked about it, and some of us didn't go down, some of us did. That's to me is proper risk management. Right. It's an interesting one. Um, I was on the Tomogamy River with a group and there was a rapid uh, in, in Hap Wilson in his guidebook. Uh, he shows you two different ways to do it. One, you just do the portage. Uh, maybe some people will know the particular rapid. I don't think it has a name, but in, in another scenario, you can do a, a tricky little piece to a, an island in the middle of the rapid and then portage the island and then uh, carry on. Um, I didn't think everybody in the group could do it. Uh, so we portaged. I, I, was I, was, I felt I was comfortable doing it, but um, I didn't leave that to a group decision. Uh, I made a decision for the group because I, I didn't want someone to be um, over their head, so to speak. So we portaged. And why that's interesting was that the, one of the people was quite mad at me because um, the guidebook said they could do it. But the guidebook doesn't assess the the whole group. <laughs> so I'm just throwing out scenarios, you know, like the guidebook made it sound like, oh, why not do this? You know, and, and Hap writes a good guidebook. He doesn't say, hey, go ahead and do this. But because it was in the guidebook, an individual was convinced that they could do it. But I had to work against, uh, I had to consider the entire group. So, you know, that's where the responsibility. That's, that's the where the only problem I think comes in is where, some part of your group doesn't have the skill, but they have the belief they do. That's that can be a problem. Yeah. So, but part of what we're doing there is we're acknowledging that it's very nuanced. That um, and and the guide ultimately is got to be able to make those judgment calls. And I'm making the point that risk management plans are taking away the responsibility from the guide. And I believe I'm not talking to you guys here. But younger people, uh, 25 and under, I think there's been a real shift in our understanding and I've seen it. So I'm, I, cause I'm on a couple of boards where I work with uh, youth programs where people actually take great pride in knowing the risk management plan inside out. And they almost take a certain pride in their loss of responsibility in the field. Um, I'm doing this because my risk management plan says to, but, but it's not common sense anymore. It doesn't matter. So I've seen that. But anyway, 
I want to, is there another uh, story or, or comment? I, 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 my, I, I'm Glenn. The, uh, I spent a long time in uh, uh, first responder emergency services. And uh, so our risk management plans, which are horrendous, always started with the phrase, under normal uh, circumstances, the following will occur. And, 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 and the whole premise of that is it gives you a little bit of wiggle room. Right. The second, the second, the second thing that, that is golden with first responder is that the only person that makes decisions at a, at a, at a response has to be on the scene. And, and, and that's kind of the other wiggle room that we provided, um, in my industry. I really like the phrase wiggle room. Everybody knows what that means. It's exactly what I'm, one of the things that I'm pushing for if I get involved in a, in a school-based risk management or camp-based risk management program. Yeah. For sure. Uh, that, that's probably enough to give the guide the responsibility that they need uh, to make a sound decision. Like, for example, the night tripping when the decision yeah. to not night trip means you have three really long days, which would be more dangerous than night tripping. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, is there anybody else want to jump in? Uh, one thing I wanted to just add was when when you disperse the the, the decision making power to a group rather than having it as as in the hands of the guide, um, you tend there are situations where people feel a little bit of peer pressure to go along with a group who are not maybe capable. And in any trip that you go on, uh, there has to be an, a, a, like you get to know the people on the trip and what their skill sets are, what their capabilities are. And uh, at some point it does feel like the buck has to stop somewhere. And I think that that place where the buck does have to stop should be the person who is ultimately responsible for the safety of the group. And that's the person who is quote unquote, the trip leader. And, um, you know, hopefully, uh, they'll be able to make a correct assessment and, and like people's egos get involved and, and that complicates things. So I just wanted yeah. to bring that up. That's, that's a great point. It's also particularly interesting as it relates to friendship group trips. So, um, Pretty much every summer I do some kind of trip. Uh, this last summer I was in Northern Saskatchewan. Um, uh, the summer before uh, pre-pandemic, I guess I was on the Thieland River. And even though I'm with uh, friends of mine aging between 55 and 75, and, and uh, some of them have more experience than I do, generally speaking in the last bunch of years, I've been the guy that you know got the maps, organized the food, brought the group together. And so, um, somewhere around the first night someone goes well i guess uh, bob you're you're going to make you're going to be the sort of prime decision guy and or it's and 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 i'm quite happy to say well I'll, i'm happy to do that um and often it, it's simply well i don't think we i think we should have lunch now you know <laughs> like it's not it's not really um a, a major deal but the group has decided that yes somebody should be in charge so i'm i'm agreeing with you there um uh and sometimes that guide's decision is to, to throw it back at the group, but ultimately uh, someone's making a decision. And that actually leads into my next set of uh, points. And so my next topic, uh, the, the, so the first topic is called stories. <laughs> the next topic is called, uh, um, the guide has to have touchstones. And uh, you can't have too many because you can't keep too much in your head. <laughs> so you, you try to, you know, strip what you what you think about as primary to the smallest number of things you can. And here's my smallest number. And I'm going to start with the one that we were just talking about. Um, the guide has to establish relational trust. And that's what we were just talking about. Uh, the guide has to uh, know the group before they go or get to know them or make it a primary task to have activities early on where you get a feel for the group. And you get to know their, uh, the quirk of the group, but you also get to know individuals. So I think that's self-explanatory. The guide also needs to have a sense of the organization, uh, the program, the school, the camp, the uh, Wilderness Canoe Association, the program under which they're guiding. And they need to have a, relation, a piece of relational trust. So that's just something that 
one has to think about. Uh, and if you were to be working, let's say, for Canoe North in the uh, Canadian Arctic on the Kiel River, you, you'd want to have a couple of strategies that on the first night you get to get a feel for who your group is, because you, you're probably going into that trip cold where you don't know the group. So you need to do some things uh, around that first campfire that, that, that gets, where's the loose cannon in the group, if there is one? You know, where, where's that person going to be that's listening to Hap's guidebook rather than listening to the guide? You know, that kind of thing. So that's one. Uh, another one is really simple, and uh, I, I've picked it up from other people, and it's just stop, yield, go. You're looking at the whole scenario of travel, and I just keep in my mind, stop, yield, go. And an example for me would be on the uh, portage up to Wolf Lake in the Chinaguchi River system, just to throw out stuff that people might know. Um, there's a really lovely uh, jumping rock that's about 10 feet. That's a go. I'm all for that. I've checked it. It's absolutely safe. If people don't want to do it, they don't have to. There's no peer pressure. You know, you set it up. But over the waterfall, there's a 20 footer. And that's not a yield. That's a no. That's that's a no. <laughs> that's a stop. Um, and I've been there with groups that have done it. And it's if anybody slides or has a second thought or succumbs to that peer pressure, they won't make the clearance. And so, you know, that's just an, by way of an example. So having a stop, yield and go. And a yield means you probably work it out with the group and you probably, um, you know, have to really sit and stew over it or get the group talking about it. Um, I, I, I had a yield this year on the... Um, Waterfound River in northern Saskatchewan, uh, there were two canoes, one group, which means there's only four people. So if you wrap a boat uh, or you lose a boat with four on the trip, you're in trouble. So you make a decision if you're on a canoe trip with four people that you're going to have to be extra safe on the river because you don't have eight people with four boats. And um, so when one, one group of two wanted to do it, I, I said, OK, well, then I won't do it. Uh, and I'm going to, you know, chicken shit with an upstream ferry and, and, and line the boat down, walk the boat down the side of the river. And um, that was a yield moment. But so you need a stop, yield, go kind of mentality. I think that's straightforward. Another thing you need to do is have common sense. And uh, Gary and I were talking about this uh, last night. We're setting up this. Um, you, you know, I, I'm, I'm all for wearing whitewater helmets. On, and this is, you know, this is a personal statement. I'm throwing myself out there. I would wear helmets on the Petawawa River because it's a rock garden. Uh, I would not wear helmets on the Keel River um, because it's fast water uh, with lots of braids and it's basically running rapids high and inside. And there just isn't those rocks and I don't, and it's sort of grade two all the way. And I just don't feel like you need the helmet. If I don't have to take a helmet, I don't want to take it because of that idea. It, it sort of presents nature is dangerous. Nature is not home. There's other, other, um, there's other sort of ambience mood setters that are at play. So, but some people would say, well, that's ridiculous. Just take the damn helmet. Always take the helmet. And I'm saying, but from that notion of common sense, you would absolutely take the helmet. If you're prepared to take the helmet on an easy grade two rapids with no running wall, with no rocks on it for the most part, then you, you almost certainly should be taking the helmet on the car to get to the rapid. And uh, you'd have a higher driver at the end of the trip when you're tired to get you out of there because the probably the most dangerous thing you're doing on a grade one, two rapid experience with relatively skilled people, the most dangerous thing you're going to be doing is driving home tired with a group who are all going to be asleep in the back of the van. You can bet on it. So, so the touchstone there is an aspect of common sense that you bring to the experience. And the last one is what is the risk capacity? And this is often a relational piece between two guides. You need to know what your relational capacity, your um, risk capacity is in relation to your co-guide and perhaps even to the group. 
I'll give you an example. It's a skiing example. Uh, maybe some people have cross country skied at Mansfield. If you go up the hill at Mansfield, there's a super steep quarry, you know, a, a horseshoe shaped quarry. And on a really intense snow year with like, I don't know, two feet of snow up there, I, I had everybody go around the edge of the quarry so that their skis were sort of sticking over the edge, spread them out more than arm's length apart and, and said on the count of three, everybody have a go for it and see if you can get to the bottom. That's not something that you have to do. I did it because I thought of the fun factor and I thought it would be a huge joyous thing. Half the people would make it, half the people would fall. I think I set it up so it was safe. My co-instructor was so pissed off at me that I did that. She didn't talk to me for the rest of the trip virtually. So, so I didn't anticipate the uh, risk capacity of my co-guide, but I did anticipate the risk capacity of these fourth year phys ed students and they were all in. And would I do it again? In a second. I just would have handled the risk capacity with my co-guide much better. So those are some touchstones that a guide has to think about. And I'll take another little pause there and see if anybody has something to add to it. And what this has been is a little section on touchstones that the guide has to have, almost like their, um, well, touchstones, where they, they, they need to always have those in their mind. So open to comments from anybody. Bob, I'll just I'll just respond generally. I mean, I'm I'm thinking about an organization that is itself has a very limited risk appetite and, and just the importance of simple rules to fulfill their basic expectations and eliminate worst case scenarios. And I'm just wondering if you know, you can't really get around them at some level. I guess the the point is not to have rules that are just unduly asinine or just completely uh, supplant common sense, but I, I come back to the the conclusion that it it's probably a trade off and a and a tough call for the people writing the rules to just sort of forbear on the, that one or two extra rule that would um, would just sort of take some of the joy out of the occasion. Um, the other comment I'd make is that I think there's probably a lot of guides around. I mean, coming up through camps or just joining the you know, joining the, uh, a volunteer activity, they just got some kind of certification, but they just don't have the experience and judgment. I mean, you've got 50 years of guiding experience and I think your judgment, you probably have a great sense of your limitations, a great sense of instances that you've encountered in the past. For someone else who's on their first trip or their fifth trip, a simple heuristic or, or guide rule could be a real godsend for them just to sort of point them at the right path and also to just sort of you know end endless debate among people in the group who each have different you know you've alluded to instances where people desperately want to do something it, it arms them a little bit to have a rule book for better or worse that simply says well i'm the guide the policy is we don't do that sorry we're going to have joy but it's just not going to be that joy Anyway, I just, you know, yeah. it's not a, uh, it's not a yes or no question. It's more, it's more a just sort of probing for where the, the balance is or where the trade-offs are on some of these issues. Yeah, and, and I like the word probing because I just want to problematize those people for whom it's a no probing affair. So my example, going back just to stick with examples, my example of the no night tripping. That's a hard and fast rule. So you know, I've already covered the idea of when it's probably more dangerous uh, to not do that night trip scenario. But you know, what about pulling out candles and going out at night to look at the stars? And it's the intentionality of getting in the canoes at night to go out to look at those stars is makes those stars more vibrant than if you'd stayed at the campfire. And I think that needs to be, that needs to have wiggle room. So uh, I, 
I just want to make sure that we problematize it where the risk management plan is adhered to like a rigid rule. That's, that's sort of where I'm coming from. If it's uh, 40 degrees and you're paddling down Big Trout Lake with a group, um, I'm all for, and you're in Grumman canoes, so that, you know, big, safe canoes that everybody knows how to get into the boat from the water. I would have kids, if they wanted to, jump out of the boat. We used to call it air raids. That's more or less been stricken from the uh, guide's manual of <laughs> things to do. And I would do that because I'm not just after joy factor, I'm after cool down and no heat stroke factor. But I mask it with a joy event. Otherwise, you pull over to shore and you go for a swim. But you know, my experience has been most people won't do that. They'll just keep paddling. And the heat will be a, you know, you could dunk your head for sure. But you know, I'm just playing, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. Uh, there needs to be a probing of the issue but what I'm terrified about is that the guide is losing the responsibility to make decisions in the field. And I do appreciate that uh, judgment takes years to develop. And I can think of a few incidences when I was in my 20s, when maybe I made a mistake of judgment uh, and it would, it would have related to relational trust of my organization. I'll give you an example. We were pulling it at a food drop in Quetico at Northern Lights Lake. And um, I knew that my 16 year old campers wanted to get drunk. They, I, could, I could hear the whisperings. It, they were planning to get a case of beer while I'm organizing four other canoe trips uh, uh, apart from my, uh, as, long, as well as my own with all the boxes of food that have come in, separating those trips into piles, helping the group, the, the staff who have less experience than me organize the food I can't spend all my time watching to see if these kids are going to get going to get beer or not. So, in knowing that that was going to happen, uh, I tried to nip it in the butt, so to speak, by saying, "Hey, listen, we're going to have fresh food tonight for dinner. What about I buy a couple of bottles of wine and we have a nice civilized dinner with wine?" And I did that, and they didn't buy the beer, and it sort of quelled that sort of youthful thing about getting drunk but it got back to the camp director and I got royal shit for it. And there was no opportunity for me to say in the field, I made the decision that I thought was right. And I was probably wrong. I shouldn't have done it. I should have just been hard ass on these kids about, 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 about the beer. So I made probably, I probably made a bad decision there, but you know, I, again, I'm trying to work the idea about the notion of the tension that exists and don't deny it. Uh, embrace it and play with it, which is sort of one of my points. Yeah, so I'm, I, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with the notion of probing it. And I do take the point that there's gonna be um, a development of judgment with years of experience. Um, but children's camps start with 18 year olds with very little experience. And they, you know, it's understood by parents or it should be that they're gaining that experience in the field. And they're gonna get more experience by having responsibility than they are, than if they don't have responsibility. So it's, it's a tricky one. All right, what about, let me move on. Uh, uh, although maybe I should leave a pause to see if somebody else wants to jump in. I'll throw in one just, uh... I usually throw in things. Um, I just remember spending, I don't know, a bit of money on uh, my son's kayak course three, four years ago. And, and he, was, he was bored um, because the risk management was really high. Um, they, they, didn't, uh, they didn't stretch him as far as he could have gone or wanted to go. And um, I just remember thinking, I hope he comes back to it. Um, after that experience so I, I just uh, and I, I I I understand where the um, the guides were at but I uh, I was disappointed that my son wasn't able to expand himself as far as he he would have liked to in that instant so what I want to pick up on on that story is the the word board um, I think it can happen that if you're at a campsite 
and you're told you can't swim until the guide is there watching and the guide isn't there watching and you're an NLS instructor and you're also told you can't jump off these 10 foot cliffs and and someone's gone and said hey man I just do a did a duck dive and this is totally safe no it's in the risk management plan you can't do it I think uh whether it's boredom or uh kind of a pissed off quality that that presents itself as boredom is is not out of the question <laughs> and uh I'd be terrified if I was a guide who was saying no too many times to uh energetic kids when they thought it was safe and they could prove it was safe so I, he did I'm improve awesome. sorry go he, ahead. Did, he did improve his chess game out of that camping <laughs> experience so there was nothing else yeah so just to be, you guys will all realize that the conversation I'm presenting and we're having, if if I was doing this at a risk management conference, um, there's a high likelihood that I would be being reamed out by people. I just I just wanted to remind people that um, I sort of am presenting uh, stuff that would be quite contentious uh, in educational settings or with risk management inclined uh, bodies. So I, I wanted to do that. So that leads me into the third part of this, which is uh, patterns of care. Again, to say that clear, patterns of care. And I think that this is key, this is key stuff to preventing injuries uh, in the field. And here they are. Don't portage and don't run white water and don't do another pitch on a on a climb late in the day. And I realize that most of you know these, so it's not something we have to go through, but uh, in any detail. But it's really common, I think, to forget them uh, because of circumstances in each given situation. Like there's a really good campsite if we just run this one more rapid, that kind of thing. Or, um, uh, yeah, or we can make our last day of trip re much shorter if we just go a little bit longer today. So in both those scenarios, in the scenario of the just let's do a bit more portaging, I was, I was on uh, Laura Creek coming down to McCarthy Bay. We did more portaging than I would have been comfortable with late in the day. And somebody slipped on a, uh, on a rock double carrying a grummond and there was a little fleck of aluminum and it's uh, coming off of the end of the bow where they were holding the boat and it's the worst injury i've had on a trip and it was uh, almost a severed finger which we had to uh, do first aid on and that was not because of the way they were carrying the canoe is that's because we were tripping too late in the day doing something quite physical so that's one of the patterns another one is um uh, well, I mean, I can think of a, a really serious one I had was in a ski tour and no, uh, it's too complicated a story. Okay. So that's one. Um, uh, uh, don't start something that's going to end late in the day. So um, always, the, the, the next one is, you know, always have the stuff that you need for the unexpected and have the right gear for the activity, of course but also have stuff for the unexpected. Everybody has their own list of things, but pretty much universally, it would be extra food vis-a-vis -vis granola bars, something easy, uh, extra water, um, uh, a quick shelter, uh, matches, uh, warmer gear. Uh, I was laughed at at Silver Star this year because I was carrying a pack. Silver Star is a cross country ski area and uh, if you go out for an hour, you can do a trail that would have you out for another hour and come back. And, you know, I, I carry a pack with extra food and water and warmer clothes in case somebody gets hurt and, and, and needs to uh, sit in the snow for a while. And I had somebody laugh at me because they, they thought I was sort of doing the Bushman thing, you know, and I should have been in tracks with, you know, ski racing equipment or something. So, you know, there's, there's kickback to some of these things, but always bring what you need for the extra stuff. Another pattern of care is always have an evacuation route, even on a ski tour or a day trip. 
know what the evacuation procedure is. And the last one is know your route and know your people. And, and uh, for 29 years at McMaster, I ran the same canoe trip every year, the same route. And I did it to maximize safety. I didn't trip in different places every year, which would have been perhaps more fun for me, uh, although I, I debate that. Um, I love going back to the same area, but I did it because it was the safest thing I could do. So those are a couple of quick you know, patterns of care. Um, the last thing I wanna talk about is public perception stuff. But before I do, there's a quote that I wanna share that I learned recently that I think is uh, it kind of at the heart of, of uh, my worry. Uh, as we get more and more removed from the natural world, and uh, in, in part, I mean more and more urban people uh, who are less and less inclined to get out even on day walks, I worry that um, policy and programming is such that, uh, this is a quote by Amelia Earhart, who wants to be imprisoned in, who wants to be imprisoned in safety? And I, I worry that if you get focused on safety, you can inadvertently imprison the, the trip in the group. And um, yeah, that's, that's a genuine worry I have. So, and here's what happens if you imprison a group in safety. You, you, there's, a, there's a tension between narrow, and I'm not sure if this language is familiar with everybody, but there's a tension between narrow risk and broad risk. Narrow risk is uh, breaking an arm, uh, uh, losing face, you know, uh, making a mistake and being embarrassed, a sprained ankle. It's physical and emotional, and it's a small scale issue. Narrow risk might seem important at the time, but in the big picture, it's not that big a deal. A bigger worry is a cultural worry, and that's the broad risk. And that's the denying of experience such that we produce you know, later life casualties where there's a, a lack of resilience or a lack of will uh, leading to maybe there's obes obesity and mental health issues. It's kind of on the macro cultural level where experiences are being denied and we're creating a risk adverse society to quote a scholar named Tim Gill. And there's a disinclination to exert oneself to try. Uh, so we need to develop more risk tolerance in our outdoor programming so that we have adventurous, spirited, engaged activity. And again, there's tensions between risk aversion and risk tolerance. Um, I'm pushing for an understanding that safety is an obviously important thing and we need to be thinking about it and aware of it, but have other aspirations for the trip, and other goals and other objectives to go along with safety. But when we limit ourselves to, was it safe? Well, then it was good. Then we've kind of reduced the canoe trip to just going to different places to eat every night safely. So that's a worry. And my last thing is, staying on this cultural level. And then I'm done and we'll throw it open for questions and, um, and, and, and discussion. So my last thing is, to me, the risk management plan is, is, um, is, is, is sort of a codified safety, is uh, arranging safety according to a rigorous plan. That's already come up, Tom brought that up. So um, better language is, is a risk benefit analysis you know, uh, analyze that, that acknowledges that you're analyzing the tension. Um, I hate to think a canoe trips, you know, can turn into sort of you safeguard the group, but you've taken away all their agency and, and you've created a joy killer, you know? So, but here's the rub because let's talk about a few scenarios. I'd like to focus on the concept of public outcry or public perception. So all recreation and all sport and all paddling is not viewed the same way in our cultural sphere. I'm gonna use um, 
I'm going to start by talking about downhill skiing and the sport of rugby. In those activities, there is, I would argue, a low degree of safety. That there's a, uns the uncertainty, there's an uncertainty of outcome quality to downhill skiing and rugby. Um, there's actually a reasonably high uh, possibility of injury and it depends on the circumstance. So compare that to rock climbing in a well-organized and, and compare it to whitewater paddling where there's a portage in a well-organized structure. So comparing climbing and canoeing, whitewater canoeing to downhill skiing and rugby. Uh, yeah, uh, there's a high degree of safety with rock climbing if there's secure rope and in the hands of a good instructor. Same for whitewater paddling where the instructor can say, we're not doing this one. And you also have always the option for portaging. There's a, a reasonable high degree of safety and the ex there's an expected outcome. And the injury um, is, I would say, negligible to the public. There's high public per perception of injury, um, high perceived risk. So this is interesting because what happens is if we take two scenarios that I'll just draw up really quickly. When Jeremiah Perry died before the pandemic at a campsite uh, by going into the water and drowning, he was on a canoe trip, but it's irrelevant what he was on. He could have been on a hiking trip. He was at, at a lake shore. And I, I'm assuming people know that scenario. And he died. There was an intense public outcry that affected outdoor programming at camps, at schools, um, at youth, youth programming. Uh, a few years earlier, a guy named Manny Castillo died on a rugby pitch and he died from a dump tackle. And the public outcry was handled completely differently. They played rugby the next day, you know? Um, it's because it's understood that in that rugby match or downhill skiing, there could be answered and the public accepts that degree of risk. But for some reason, it doesn't accept risk in a camping outdoor scenario. So when we look at what risk entails, there's a mathematical formula that people are using and it's risk equals the probability times the magnitude. So there's a probability of risk that's pretty high in downhill skiing. It's not unlikely that you're gonna get run over by another skier or boarder. So the probability is quite high and the magnitude can be quite severe, but we accept the risk in downhill skiing, whereas we don't with outdoor programming. And what that's about is the quality that has to be added to that mathematical formula. So the new formula should be risk equals probability times magnitude plus the public outcry. Um, and I have details about the rugby scenario because there was also recently, and, and then I'll finish up, uh, recently a... Um, a boy that had a, he was in Cape Breton in a rugby match and he sustained a spinal and he was helicoptered uh, down to um, uh, Halifax and uh, the Halifax or the school board, the Nova Scotia school board uh, banned rugby for the next day. And kids on the team, parents, um, a minister of uh, recreation uh, in the government all piped up with how dare you ban rugby. Uh, this didn't happen when um, Jeremiah per Perry uh, died. Uh, rather, uh, there was intense scrutiny put on the teacher, and I think there should have been, and outdoor programming generally, which I don't think there should have been. So it's an interesting issue. And I think you can't talk about risk without acknowledging that cultural presence of public outcry. Uh, I just thought of something that I wanted to add for fun. Uh, one way of getting around some of these things, there was a school board that a teacher had been teaching rock climbing at Rattlesnake Point for decades. 
And then the risk management program said he had to scrap it altogether. And he really believed in it for qualities beyond teaching rock climbing. He believed it was a big part of helping kids develop generic skills, uh, skills that produce skills, if you will. He thought it was important for their maturation as people. So he just, he didn't break the rule. He shifted all his climbing teaching to big trees. And there was no policy about climbing big trees. And he had kids top roped and roped up and, and working with trees. And he got around the risk management plan that way. So I'm not sure why I'm finishing with that, but <laughs> um, I guess I'll finish with how I started. I think that the main thing is that the main thing should be the main thing. And the main thing should be something about outdoor travel with groups other than just safety. There's other reasons we're there other than it just being safe. And we can't lose track of those things uh, with an overdeveloped um, extreme uh, definition of how to handle risk, an overbearing definition. So I'm advocating for more attention to the quirky -ish side effects and the, the tensions that exist in, the, in, in this discussion and not having it become rigid. And it, it has become quite rigid for schools and camps. And, and I, I think um, we adults need to know this sort of thing. Okay, I'm gonna pack it up here and throw it open for questions. Brian Johnson said a couple of things on the chat. He goes, I'd be curious to know the data stats on high school and college football injury compared to high school and college outdoor ed activities. Um, it's extreme. Um, Ryan Howard with Alive could give you those stats, Brian. I could set that up and you could get them. Uh, Ryan and I were going to write an article in Paddling, uh, Paddler Magazine on just that topic. And I believe we, we did put in some statistics in that. Um, I don't know why risk management community is so adverse to common sense, but I think it has something to do with, um, if you focus on one thing and make that primary, then everything else becomes secondary. And I think then you lose your common sense equation. That's a, an answer that may be too simplistic, but um, we have a duty of care in the field, but we also have a duty uh, for, for joy and for successful trip. Um, this is all very refreshing to hear, my friend. Well, I, I'm trying to problematize the rigid, rigid, rigidity in risk management plans. Hey, Rob, you... Rob James, do you, want to, do you want to describe your scenario? That might be too daunting for me to read. Robert James, do you want to speak up on, on the point you may, you're making in the chat? Um, sure. Um, I guess I guess it came down to when you when you talk about downhill skiing. Downhill skiing is an individual sport. When someone screws up, they they hit a tree or they hit another person or whatever. Um, they are accountable for their own actions, and there's a certain expectation that they know how to ski or they're on a hill. Um, uh, and skiing within their own level of ability. Contrast that with the idea of an outdoor trip. When you're when 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 you take a group of kids on a, on a, on a trip, there's no expectation that the kids have uh, the knowledge or skills to be able to uh, not get themselves into trouble. So therefore, if there is any accident or any problem or issue, uh, it's got to be the guide's fault. The guide will be held accountable, and people will complain loudly and vocally because their kid, who is completely innocent um has been led into trouble by, by 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 a guide and it comes down to accountability and responsibility in uh, with individual sports that you mentioned before including climbing including um the downhill skiing um accountability is clear it's on the individual for outdoor hey. group trips it's on the guide right hey you know what i'm just going to go point taken uh, I was using the downhill example in another context. So from the concept of accountability, I totally agree with you. And thank you for making the point. Um, I wasn't fully clear on it. I was addressing the issue in, in terms of public outcry. 
and, and not in terms of accountability. If there's an injury skiing, people go, oh, what the heck? They hurt themselves skiing. It happens all the time. But if you're in an outdoor program and you hurt yourself um, at, at camping, burning yourself by the campfire, there is an intense public outcry. So, yeah. but you're right. When it comes to accountability, it is different. Hey, you know, here's something interesting on risk management plans on, on downhill skiing. Um, I've heard it's been said that in, an, in a risk management plan by somebody else, and I didn't see the plan, so I'm going on hearsay, that the risk management plan says, don't ski the edges of the hill, ski the middle of the hill. And of course, the problem with that is, if everybody's skiing the middle of the hill, one, the middle of the hill is dangerous by volume of people, but two, all the snow is scraped off the middle of the hill. And for people that know how to ski, the best skiing is on the edge of the hill. So that risk management policy piece was written by somebody that probably is not somebody that skis that's all that's just you know just a point so let's see what other people have by way of there was a lot of stuff we talked about it was a conversation meant to be about risk in a you know in the broadest sense and i'm just curious to know what, where people are at and what where they want to go with it thanks for that comment robert i appreciate that uh i'm i'm better for that <laughs> thanks I think one of the issues that I see is uh, you know, when they have a group of adults, and we're always dealing with adults, I would say generally, you've got to make sure your group is um, in the same mindset. And you know, you lay out for the WCA, you lay out the trip, we're going on a mission, or it's super casual, or it's somewhere in the middle, so that the people that are on the trip you know, they're in the, okay, we're going to do 15K a day or we're going to do 35K a day and this speed and this distance. So you kind of lay it out and you will attract those types of people. And and you make it so, I always look at the kind of the three zones of your comfort zone and your stretch zone, which is like your learning zone and then the panic zone. And with the people in the group, you know, if you're all capable of class two, three rapids, when you hit a class two, three rapid, you're in your comfort stretch zone, you know, but if you have one or two members in that group that never did a rap in their life, they're in the panic zone. So you really got to figure out in your group what the dynamics is. And, you know, um, and then the problem then is if you got two extremes of people in the group, I mean, you either divide them up. So you put them with an experienced person, but it's still you're stretching probably the person that's only been class nothing rapids you're scaring them senseless you're in the panic zone and other people are that are really you know well suited to do class three they're bored silly because you're skipping class threes now so nobody's happy so it's really yeah. important when you set up a an outing you kind of balance the group and and the expectations so that everybody realizes we're doing, I don't know, whatever, four or five hours a day and 20K and, you know, this kind of thing, or we're having a, a layover day. So that's the important thing I've found when I'm doing trips. The other side of it is, one more point is when you're on an event and you realize there's weaker people or people that don't want to go as fast, you got to come up with plan B. And plan B might be you're changing your plan from what you thought you're going to do 100k in you know eight days okay we're only going to do 60k you're going to do something different so you got to be prepared to make those decisions and and maybe it's a group decision but that's an aspect that you could uh, recover maybe from um uh, you know yeah. well planned out trip maybe or so just what, the dynamics what, what, or... yeah Gary, one person creation is kind of curious if there's a way for us to sort of evaluate the individuals in our group, put some sort of level on their skill level, like A, B, C, D, or E, and then say for this particular trip, we need all Bs, or we need Bs and Cs, or we need... Yeah, well, we so kind of do that, that with... You, um, you could do that by saying, uh, we're going to get going at nine o'clock, we're going to only paddle to four o'clock or less. We're going to do 20 K or less, you know, you, you lay it out. Right. And, you know, if you're going to, if you say something like, I'll give you an idea. There was one trip last year to Killarney 
the organizers said, we are doing one-shot portages. So if nobody's going to sign up if they can't do one-shot portages, right? So they say they laid the groundwork. They're going on a mission. And I used to be like that 20 years ago. But, you know, now I realize I want to get more people. So I can't say that anymore, right? So this is the thing. You lay it out, the speed, the time, whatever, and you will attract or not attract people. Now, anybody can lie, right? Anybody can say, oh, I've done, you know, class three stuff, no problem. And they get there and they really haven't, right? So, or they did it 20 years ago, Brett Gary. That's, yeah, that's I another agree. option. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, agree. I, I did it. I just did it 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's a lot harder when you get older. And that's the issue. Like, I find the, the beauty of the club, I've met some excellent people that are, you know, 65, 70, whatever, 80. They know everything but they can't lug that canoe anymore, <laughs> right? But on the flip side, you get a couple 20, 30-year-olds. They don't know where to go, but they can lug that canoe. <laughs> so that's have, what you're trying to team up sometimes. Have, have, uh, has the idea of having uh, co-leaders uh, come up? I mean, you mentioned, Gary, like you've got a group with with really disparate skill sets. Yeah. Um, you know, having a, having somebody and also sort of a chain of command thing might, might in, in a sense, be nice to have somebody. So like when trips are led by one individual, I think it's a, a riskier proposition when they're co-led by two people that can kind of work with the group and figure out who's capable of what. And so everybody's got a leader, no matter which camp they fall into, whether they're, a, you know, a, a really competent uh canoeist or whether they're just still finding their legs yeah i think we do do that on on the trips that i go on uh you know if i launch it i'm the leader but what happens is you divide up the task saying uh, okay you work on the shuttle you work on the canoe rentals because we're you know going to whitehorse or wherever you work so you divide it up if you have a medical person yeah you're in charge of medical <laughs> you know you're gonna bandage us up you're gonna call the shots uh, you're in charge of the kitchen. You're so you divide up the tasks. So you don't have to do it all if you trust the people, right? And obviously, there's always little screw ups. Uh, yeah, you know, shuttles or airplanes or something. But generally, if you divide the task up, you're just doing one little element of it, and it all comes together in a spreadsheet and Zoom meetings or whatever. So we do do that. Um, I don't know if anybody else in the audience has experience with launching trips, but. Um, Generally, if you can divide up the tasks, that's the way to do it. Yeah, my experience has always been just with whitewater guys that do, uh, you know, pretty class two to class four or five, mm -hmm. not really the smaller stuff. So, and I, I've always dealt with competent paddlers. I want to go back to the point that uh, Robert James brought up there. And, and back to kind of Bob's risk management aspect of the presentation. So I always get this feeling with risk management plans that the concept is we want to keep everybody safe. So if I go on a backcountry back country trip by myself, I'm responsible for myself. But if I go on an organized trip, then I give up a bunch of that responsibility and the leader assumes all that responsibility. And I think at times it's unfair that you know, if something minor goes wrong, they still get blamed for that. Right. Because Brian, there is no, no risk. <laughs> it's impossible. There is no such thing as no risk, be it physical or emotional. There's always risk. Uh, where would we be without it? You know, yeah. risk, it largely has to do with testing our, testing our powers. Uh, being who we are, testing who we are. We get sort of a joy from uh, accepting and embracing uh, the burden of living, the, the things that come up that are burdensome, but they're burdensome and rewarding. What is sport if not burdensome and testing our powers? Uh, yeah, and you, you and I both have an educational background, so we know that if you if your risk management policy is so restrictive, you can't have any educational success. It defeats the purpose of the trip. 
Yeah, and I think I I I think there are examples where that's the case. Um, and I've had these debates with people that uh, with OFIA, which is an Ontario body that has produced uh, risk management plan work, um, and and they'll tell me that jumping off rocks is is not germane to the canoeing experience, a canoe travel experience. And I'm going, well, um, then what is important in the canoeing experience? Canoeing, eating, and sleeping. Everything else is secondary. That's where I get this idea that once you focus on something and make it primary, then the other stuff becomes secondary and we start cutting out the nature experiences and the joy experience. And a, and a nature experience would be taking the group out at night with a couple of candles on the canoe, you know, like tea candles or something and sitting for half an hour watching the stars and risk management plans say no night canoeing. And that's taking away uh, something I used to do, it would do with groups all the time. And I found that the intentionality of it is hugely important to the success of it. So you can't have the same experience sitting at the campfire. So anyway, that's I'm just sharing that and going over that example again. I'm glad you're advocating for change. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, to get a hook for it, so it's it's it. In other words, people uh, need a hook to to you know to get their point across and. In my academic environment, my hook is that I'm a joy ambassador. And that's tongue in cheek, of course, but uh, it's making a point. Now, uh, Worth Donaldson has a something in the chat. Worth, I'm going to read it slowly to myself, but we, do you want to go over it? Or I don't know how many people are on the chat uh, when we're trying to identify. No, I was just trying to make the comment that I find it frustrating when I reach out to some of the government um, authorities out there and I'm doing trip planning, trying to identify the degree of risk that I may encounter um, in order to help me decide upon how much risk I am willing to assume. I feel like a lot of times you get an answer from the authorities that's geared more toward those with little to no experience um, based upon basically, you know, they don't want to be held liable for um, potentially giving you information that gets you in, in over your head. Um, so I want to share an example of that. Um, and, and I can't, this is not so solving that. I share the same frustration, but Here's my uh, favorite example for this. Um, there used to be a, a cross country ski race in Algonquin Park. Uh, it was over in the leaf trails on the east end of the park. And um, the races stopped. And the reason why it stopped is because uh, when they were grooming the uh, trails on the lake for the race, the five ton, and I, it is a five ton groomer, went through the ice and there were two people on the groomer that day and one died and one survived. And as a result of that, Algonquin Park made a new policy and I don't know the ins and outs of how they came to this, but they made a policy that said, there will be no park attention or allowances for travel on ice, whether it be four inches which is the beginning of it being safe in my book, to three feet, which you could drive a five ton vehicle over. So if you call Algonquin Park now and you ask them, how are the ice? How's the ice there? It's incumbent on them not to tell you. And there are signs at all the access points that says, we recommend you not travel on ice or ice is dangerous and you shouldn't go out there. And what's being neglected is traveling on ice was when most peoples in winter found the great joy and freedom to get around easily. Like traveling on ice is, uh, you know, a cultural mainstay of winter. And why it stopped in Algonquin Park was because a five ton vehicle went through the ice and killed a park staff. So it's, it's not a small thing. <laughs> this is a big deal. 
um, because people are now becoming afraid of ice uh, when we should be playing hockey, you know, <laughs> and, and going for snowshoes. So this common sense factor that Brian referred to on the chat as well is, uh, is not a small issue. It's a big deal with ramifications uh, that are significant moving forward. Uh, that's all I have to say. Has the park staff person been killed on? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So uh, it, it'd be fair to say that more people are killed on the road than killed on the grooming machine. Yeah. But but see, that goes back to the question of, of um, public outcry and what's accepted. It's it's a given that people will, dry, will, will die in cars. Um, here's an interesting one. I'm told that in America, every Friday night, most municipalities have a football game and there's an ambulance at that football game to deal with the impending injury. And I, I know of no outdoor instructor that has an ambulance parked in the parking lot to deal with the possibility of an injury. But it's a given for football that there, will, that there should be an ambulance waiting to take away the wounded. That culturally, we've got some things screwy, screwed up there. That's not a good way to end, though. <laughs> so, <laughs> I am um, just going back to kids. My my main concern is is um, I I know I've tried to introduce canoeing to uh, uh, my public school that uh, that my kids go to, and it's a it's a flat no. Um, um, the board just has a kids have to stay away from water policy, and um, I. You know, and and everything I've suggested is not me uh, doing something. It's doing it within a, a an organized setting with trained staff and a pond, really, not even a uh, a moving water scenario. Um, but it, it is concerning because um, kids just don't get out anymore. Um, so, <laughs> outside of school, when my friends, uh, my kids' friends come. It's a, it's really a, 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 an abstract experience for them to get out on the water and canoe a river, and uh, and that's only two or three kids out of each of my kids' uh, classes and whatnot. Yeah. So I, I think it's it's a concern. It's also a concern for WCA if nobody knows what a canoe or water is. Um, you know, it it uh, doesn't bode well for membership in the next decade or two. Right. Yeah. And so the, the part of the talk that I gave that addresses that, Christopher, and I was trying to give people the language for it, you, you know, you, you, you're, you make a great point. And where one would argue that point is with that notion of narrow risk, which is the possibility of some injury related to being in a canoe. Sure, it's a possibility against the broad risk of denying youth experiences that engage them in living living a healthy life and we need to start addressing the when butt up against a risk management plan we and and some sort of spurious structures that negate canoeing in the school board for example one should be pointing out the um the tyranny built into uh the broad risk problem of later life casualties Bob, how would you go about explaining that to a school board? People that are just have no clue about outdoor outdoor activities and doing stuff. Many of them don't even do it. We do have a couple of teachers that do join our club, but there's a lot of teachers who, you know, they work, they go home, they don't do nothing else. Well, I guess I'd be saying, where's the result? Um, if there's talk about mental health issues and there's talk about obesity and there's talk about elastic lack of resilience and and i would suggest well then we should be providing more experiences a more a wider breadth of experiences to engage youth in in adventurous um spiritist activities where yeah there'll be some element of risk involved because there is no such thing as no risk and uh you know, I don't have an answer, but I, I've, I've had to have these arguments. And uh, um, 
And I, I often do what uh, Bert Horwood taught me, if people know him, is try to invert the logic. So, you know, Bert, for example, uh, here's one of Bert's points of logic that inverts logic. It would be, if you lead a night hike with a flashlight, it's a day hike. <laughs> you know, similarly, um, uh, there's no such thing as no risk. So anyway, um, I've got, I, I think we should wrap up Gary in terms of timing, but I wanted to have something to close on. And, um, it, and it, 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 it sort of follows from what we just were, what we're dealing with was that notion of a risk adverse society. And I think we've moved into that from sort of the seventies and eighties. And it's, it's, it, I mean, maybe you want to grab a pen because I think this is a real gem. But to capture what a risk-adverse society is, there's a little passage by a guy named Tim Gilmore, who, who I don't know, and I don't know where, what his background is, but he's got a lovely little saying, and it's, uh, the problem right now with youth is we risk too little, we rescue too soon, and we rave, we rave about their accomplishments too much. And I, I think that's a great thing to keep in mind for parenting, for, for guiding a group, uh, uh, there's a sort of realism to it. Again, it's risk too little, rescue too soon, and rave too much. And uh, I've had sort of pretty good experience throwing that out to people and using it as a discussion point. So that's, uh, that's what I've got on risk. And it's not laden with answers, but I, I like to think I was uh, helping people on the call, working together on the call to develop some language pieces that might help us begin to address these issues as it pertains to our canoe tripping world. So, um, Gary, I, I'd like to sort of thank everybody for the opportunity and uh, wrap up with anything you want to say about club activities. Does that, does that make sense? Okay, thank you very much, Bob. Yeah, we had some good discussions there. Um, like anything, I mean, there's there's uh, so many different scenarios, right? So you end up with, um, you know, any kind of uh, number of scenarios you can come up with. Uh, we've all dealt with some risk. And um, I think it's like anything, when you have an incident, you do personally pull back. And it takes a little while, then you get back into it again. Um, but you know, there's ramifications when you have something that happens. And, um, and I find like, I, I really enjoy the after, like the D the briefing after the event. And I always kind of ask myself, okay, what does the club have to do different? What do I have to do different? What do other people have to do different? So it's like a learning curve. And then me, even if I screwed up, I go, okay, what can I do better next time that this wouldn't happen again? So I think it's all learning. Sometimes when you have a, an issue, like you wipe out in a rapid and you go, okay, I'm not running the next one because you, you know, you went beyond your skill level and you hurt yourself or whatever you do back off. It's just a natural human reaction. Um, and then you eventually get back on the horse and then everything's okay again for a while until the next thing happens. But uh, I don't know if anybody else has that kind of uh, insight on uh, they had an experience and they, you know, pulled back or whatever. I think we probably all have, but. Yeah. Well, it, it, you can't teach judgment. I, you know, there, you know, but there's something on the chat that I just saw, Gary, that I'd love to just quickly respond to. Sure. Uh, Brian, uh, we need to put a price tag on negating experiences. In other words, the threat and the uh, acknowledgement there is a problem with broad risk. So uh, there is a woman at McMaster University. Her last name is Brown. I don't, I've forgotten her first name, but a friend of mine named Alan Crawford knows her well. And she's done studies in, in health and economics where she's looked at later life casualties vis-a-vis -vis mental health and uh, obesity. And she's put, she's put dollar figures on it. So uh, if you were to email me, Brian, I could get you uh, 
uh, work that has put a price tag on on what you ask about. Um, it, so my my email is b hender, as in Bob Henderson, b hender at mcmaster.ca, and uh, I'd love to contact Al Crawford and see if he can get me uh, uh, Brown's uh, first name, and and you could look her up. But anyway, that's just something that uh, comes to mind, and I'm getting people signing off and uh, thanking me for uh, for this, which was, was lovely. And thanks to you, uh, uh, Gary, and the WCA for uh, having me involved. It's my second webinar, and I've, I've really enjoyed the opportunity, and uh, I really enjoyed the opportunity to, to uh, interact with people on these um, on these webinars. So I think it's it's great work, and I should, as a compliment to the Wilderness Canoe Association, note that. Uh, the literature that we produce on the website that spells out uh, choosing a group and goes through scenarios uh, like um, the policy and the stuff that's written in our literature of, about trips and guiding is is really good. So uh, it, it's not uh, too onerous in terms of a risk management uh, agenda. So congratulations to the, well, the well thought out stuff by the by the Wilderness Canoe Association. Yeah, I think one of the things we do do is when we had an issue or an incident, we always go back and ask ourselves, should we update that policy or that guideline? And you'll see on the policy, it was created in 2010 and revised in 2017 and 19 and 21. So it's you could see somebody went back and flipped it and you know added a few words because we missed something or wasn't crystal clear. But again, we're not trying to over constrain people we're just trying to you know give them reasonable guidelines so that's uh and and tom's been involved he's on the board and he's been involved uh, heavily in a lot of the documents uh especially during the COVID, where we we're inventing waivers and all kind of things going through the policies with COVID and trying to meet the government guidelines so that was you know excellent um all behind us now i hope Anyways, yeah. thanks again. Uh, whoever has missed some of this presentation, it will be recorded or is being recorded, and I'll flip it onto YouTube within a week. So I think we'll sign off, and thanks, everybody, for showing up. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Gary. Bye now. Thank you.